Who are the biggest defensive winners from the Dolphins' Week 6 victory over the Carolina Panthers? We check the tape, and we have my answers here today on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. You are Locked on Dolphins, your daily Miami Dolphins podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, Miami. Welcome to another episode of Locked On Dolphins. It's your team every day here on the Locked On Network. I'm your host, Kyle Krabs, a lifelong Miami Dolphins fan, host of Locked On Dolphins, co-host of Locked On NFL Scouting. You can find our shows on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Tip of the cap to the everydayers who are locked in with us on a daily basis because it is your team every day. We don't just say it. We live it here on the Locked On Network. Today's episode of Locked On Dolphins is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. We have taken the course of the night last night to finish watching, uh, going back through the performance of the Miami Dolphins defense against the Carolina Panthers, and wanted to kind of go over some of the notes that I have here is in regards to, uh, I guess winners and losers is probably the best way to put it. Uh, because I, I do think there were a number of performances throughout the course of this football game that I think are really foundational opportunities for what it can look like moving forward for you on certain fronts. And we'll start with the front. We'll start with the defensive line. Uh, the Miami Dolphins, and here's just a quick recap of what the Dolphins did defensively in week six against the Panthers. Uh, they finished conceding 296 yards of offense on 11 drives, an average of 4.4 yards per play. The Panthers averaged 4.4 yards per pass attempt. Uh, they sacked Bryce Young four times for 36 yards. They conceded 4.3 yards per rush on 25 carries, so 108 yards uh, the Panthers possessed the ball for 30 minutes and 44 seconds. They were two for two in the red zone, uh, and they were five of 18 on third and fourth downs. Now, Miami spotted them 14 points to start. Carolina scratched out a defensive touchdown late in the fourth quarter in the final five minutes. That was their only score after the first quarter. And just a quick recap, because I do think this is worth acknowledging as well. Carolina's possessions. After the first quarter, when Carolina went 7 for 64 and 10 for 74 uh, with their second and third possessions of the game. 7 for 31, 3 for 4, 8 for 40, 6 for 6, 10 for 51, turnover on downs, 4 for minus 8, 7 for 32, 4 for 6. The Dolphins really did batten down the hatches as this game went along, and they made some adjustments. And uh, I think you can point to uh, a handful of individual plays from the first quarter that really compounded your issues, whether that be 12 men on defense or defensive lineman Emmanuel Agba jumping two gaps down inside to give up an outside run. Um, there, there are a handful of plays. The at the dropped coverage for Adam Thielen, where he's running over the middle of the field, that was actually just a very nice throw from Bryce Young in rhythm um, to be able to, to connect and, and really flip the field and put them in position to score points. And you had a third down where you. Uh, missed an opportunity to get off the field. Up front for the Dolphins, I thought this was the best pairing of performance that you got from Christian Wilkins and Zach Sealer combined. I thought this might be the best game that Bradley Chubb played as a member of the Miami Dolphins for you. Those three performances plus the return of Jalen Phillips, as you move forward from here, and I understand, Carolina's offensive line is performing at a level that is not a level that is playoff caliber football. Missing a couple guys at guard. But Taylor Moton was still out there. Starting center still out there. Starting left tackle still out there. For Christian Wilkins and Zach Sealer to find the consistency in uh, disrupting up front against the pass, and still being positive presences against the run, I think is a very helpful development for Miami. In case in point, they were first and second on the team in pressure. Sealer with five, Wilkins with four, Bradley Chubb also had four. They combined for three sacks in this game. Christian Wilkins and Zach Sealer did. 
And this is supposed this was always supposed to be the identity of what your football team was. Was stout up front, have some ball hawks on the back end, have speed at linebacker, and piece it all together. The stout up front part, uh, you've seen it with the exception of week one, week four. You'll get your next chance in week seven because you're going against the Philadelphia Eagles offensive line that may or may not have Lane Johnson, but even if they don't have Lane Johnson, this is still one of the best offensive lines in football. It's a big gut check week for everybody up front. Hopefully Jalen Phillips, uh, whose return was okay. They acknowledged he was on a pitch count. Um, can knock the rust off, and, and he can be an even bigger presence this upcoming week as well. But uh, I definitely thought from a complimentary rush perspective, watching them play off of each other, Christian Wilkins and Zach Sealer, uh, running games, stacking the point of attack, uh, the, the defensive ends getting in chemistry as far as knowing when to steal gaps. I thought there were one or two times where it looked like Christian Wilkins did get a little over aggressive, tried to shoot into the backfield and kind of hung a linebacker out to dry. Um, continuing to find the balance there. Uh, that, that was a big problem for Miami in the first game of the season. And it's kind of been pieced together. Um, but I was generally very encouraged in watching Bradley Chubb give you perhaps his best performance. He nearly took Bryce Young's head off on that sack on the opening possession. He worked his way on, on the inside shoulder of Ikem Ikwanu, actually forced a fumble on the play. Bryce Young just happened to fall directly down on top of the ball. The uh, defensive penalty that took Bradley Chubb's second sack of the game off the board, uh, I thought was an incredibly soft call to make. Um, so you had Bradley Chubb kind of knifing through the front uh, in run support, uh, kind of identifying it felt like the Dolphins came into this game plan with we're going to look to pinch and spill runs with the defensive ends, get him outside. Now, that wasn't always a flawless plan uh, because you did see on one of the touchdown drives, Emmanuel Agba jumped down inside and he had no help and support behind him. And Ikemi Kwanu comes off the line and this man disappears and they're running a wide zone to the left. And Agba disappears. Van Ginkle is not expecting to have to exchange. So he's staying with the leverage that he has. So as this run works up, uh, it, it really puts you in a, a tough spot where you have no edge at all. And um, I think if I had to, to point to something that I'm discouraged by from the front in this game, it is the second group. You saw a lot of four-man front, two interior defensive linemen, not your base, three, four, it made a couple cameo appearances, but by and large, this was four down, four two five defensive structure, and you had the second line was Andrew Van Ginkle, Deshaun Hand, Raekwon Davis, and Emmanuel Agba. And if you were not Andrew Van Ginkle, I did not think your contributions in this game against that front for Carolina were particularly inspiring. And looking at that performance and comparing it to the performance of those individual players all season long, if Miami's going to buy at the deadline here in the next two weeks, an interior defensive lineman would probably be my number one spot that I would look to see them at. And we'll talk linebackers. That's next. We saw a little bit more of Duke Riley than we're used to after Jerome Baker had a back injury. That's next here on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. So stick with us. Today's episode of Locked on Dolphins is brought to you by BetterHelp. You ever feel like your brain is getting in your own way? Like you know what you should do, know what's good for you, but you just can't do it? Therapy figures out what's holding you back so you can work for yourself instead of against yourself. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's done entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule you can fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Make your brain your friend with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. Did the game just go to timeout? 
If it did, it's time to order DoorDash. If it's halftime, that's ordering time. And two-minute warning, that's your warning to get your order in. Make sure you have everything you need for game day at the house with DoorDash. You can order wings, soda, burgers, or even just buns on DoorDash and get it all delivered without missing the game. Uh, You can score football season's best deals on groceries, restaurants, retail, and more. Uh, So you could rest easy knowing that you are prepared for game day. Stock up on your favorite appetizers and order all your tailgate gear on DoorDash. Get ready to watch your team win. You can get 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order. When you download the DoorDash app and enter code LOCKED23, subject to tame, change terms do apply. That's 50% off up to a $10 value when you spend $15 or more on your first order when you download the DoorDash app and enter code LOCKED23. Subject to change and terms do apply. From a second level of the defense standpoint, uh, I think you're getting there. You know, I came out of this game and there were a couple of middle of the field throws that you wish David Long and Jerome Baker had a little bit better vision cone for, if you will, if you were playing the old school Madden games that had the quarterback vision cone. And, and that's obviously not the same as a linebacker vision cone, but um, I, I think you're you're close to getting more positive contributions defending the middle of the field. And you saw the Dolphins as this game went on, they started rolling the safety down to, for, for safety rotation to get somebody coming from leverage to come down and cut the crossers. I think that was one of the bigger adjustments that was made throughout the course of the game. It was more of split safety looks. We're going to roll one safety down, and we're going to look to cut those crossers to make sure that if you're going to put Adam Thielen in the nickel and he's going to have an opportunity or in – in a bunch set and he's going to have an opportunity to draw our nickel corner or Perry Nickerson, if we're in dime and uh, try to run away from leverage, we have somebody with a, a field of vision that can see that route developing. And from a linebacker perspective, it is tough because you have to account for the run. Carolina had some early success with the run. Um, I, I thought they really got after again, that second defensive line, Uh, When they ran the ball and and punched you in the mouth, they caught you with the second line on the field. You had a miscommunication on the edge for a chunk gain, and then they came right at you. And if you're in a position as a linebacker where I know I got to have run support and I got to be ready to fly up in here because they did get some early success in the game, and then I got to worry about crossers that are coming out of my peripheral vision, it's one of the more unadmirable roles to have to fill in an NFL defense. It's it's literally the Sean McVay formula of uh, we're going to put you in the spin cycle and make you battle all day long. Mike McDaniel's taking it to a new level with what the Dolphins offense looks like. But I, I felt like there was some of that conflict that existed early in this game. Now, I thought they both settled in. I thought there was some good physicality from both linebackers. I thought once Duke Riley came into the game, uh, you were in a position to not feel the effects of Duke Riley having to play off of contact more. I think Duke's a better pace and space player and pursuit player than he is somebody who in a light box count is really going to get downhill and really going to blow up blocks with any level of consistency just because he's uh, he's not the biggest of guys. And I don't think he has as heavy of a set of pads as David Long does. And David Long, you saw it a couple of times. He gets down in the gaps. He's like, oh, okay, I'm the plug guy. Watch this. Boom. And he comes with everything. And he puts his shoulder pad into the chest of that offensive lineman and he stands him up. And he's capable of some really, really nice leveraged hits. Um, so I think the game script helped you when you missed Jerome Baker for a stretch of the game. But I again came out of this game just like last week with an appreciation for how much of pulling the strings Jerome Baker does on the front. I, I think he is the more trusted of the two linebackers from an assignments perspective and from a communications perspective Uh, and playing off of the defensive lineman is still, again, a work in progress. I thought you saw that on a number of occasions where Raquan Davis is set up in a gap and he looks to talk back to the backside a when really the play is hitting front side and Raquan's in that spot 
and the linebackers fitting backside A because Raekwon's got his head on the right side of the center. Well, then Raekwon ducks his head across the other side, and that run rips up, and it's a big gain in between the tackles because we ended up having two defenders in the same gap. And little stuff like that, like, I don't know how you're going to continue to get better at it without having to work through it and develop a chemistry of playing behind your guys. But those are the kinds of things against Philadelphia that if Philadelphia is going to be committed to come out and run the football with consistency, we got to be a little bit more prepared for. Uh, that is one of the challenges of the game. Now, of course, Miami, you, you look at statistically what they have been able to do throughout the course of this season from a run defense perspective after the first game. It's settled down. You, you've, And some of that is thanks in large part to the Patriots chasing the game. The Broncos chasing the game. The Giants chasing the game. The Panthers, after the first half, were chasing the game. If you can continue to apply pressure offensively in the way that Miami does, that is going to lend itself well to alleviating that concern. And I see flashes of it getting better, including from the linebackers. But I don't think it, it's championship caliber chemistry just yet. And that's okay. The challenge is you're going to have to work around it throughout the course of the next two of the next three weeks when you play Kansas City and you play the Philadelphia Eagles. These are big tests, and you have to have the answers. Uh, otherwise, those, two, those teams with how successful they can be and the different ways that they can attack you, uh, they will really stress you and, and apply pressure to you in that regard. So um, I thought the linebackers uh, played an okay game all things considered, I, I didn't think there was um, any egregious busts like there have been in the past. I think there were some miscommunications up front. Um, I didn't think there were a, a lot of egregious missed tackles in space. Uh, I think your missed tackles, uh, you, you really got hit with some sack opportunities. Uh, you got hit a couple times with the secondary on the edge. But by and large, I, I thought... Um, your linebackers themselves played a sturdy uh, game against the Carolina Panthers who, who uh, maybe didn't have the most robust skill group to work with, but they still had an athletic tight end in Tommy Tremel, and they still had a back in Chuba Hubbard who ran pretty hard when he had opportunities with the football. So uh, all in all, I, I'd give this kind of an, an above average assessment for the linebacker group. Uh, certainly I don't think was the the starring role that some of the guys up front had in this game. And um, I certainly don't think it was a, a long list of liabilities or missed opportunities for them. They're getting close. And as soon as they feel these routes and they carry it a little bit more, they're going to squeeze these throws. Or if I'm the other linebacker and I feel that route developing and I'm able to use my vision to feel where the quarterback's at simultaneously while, while I'm relating to my assignment on the back end of the progression, if I can feel it and drop into it, I'm going to fall into a pick. And it's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. One of the linebackers is going to fall into a pick because I think they're getting really close. And that's going to say something because this defense, uh, turnovers, they were close on a few, uh, but they did not get any for yet another football game. And it's something that uh, it, we're waiting for that light switch to come on as well. We're going to talk secondary to finish on this episode of Locked on Dolphins. So stick with us. If you're looking to get to the game, if you're looking to spontaneously head up to the city of brotherly love, you want to hit the link for Sunday Night Football, Dolphins-Eagles. It's obviously a huge contest in the first half of the season, but you're just now getting your plans together. We got no worries. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase because they're obsessed with finding ways to save you money on tickets. You can see your seat view before you buy with game time. So you know exactly what to expect when you arrive and you can find last minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals, easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area or not in your area. If you are feeling spur of the moment to head up the coast and go to Philadelphia game time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event. And even an hour after it starts, it's the place to find last minute seats. And with zone deals, you can pick the section and game time picks the seats for an average of 18% savings. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on NFL. Download game time today. 
Last minute tickets, lowest price guarantee. So this Dolphins secondary in this game, we had some moving parts. Uh, you saw more of Perry Nickerson this week as the dime. You saw a lot of Eli Apple. From a snap count perspective, Cater Kohu, 64 snaps. Javon Holland, 64 snaps. Deshaun Elliott, 64 snaps. Eli Apple, 64 snaps. Xavier Howard played 55 snaps. Uh, and then the rest of the secondary. Perry Nickerson, 20 defensive snaps. Cam Smith, 5. Elijah Campbell and Brandon Jones, 5 apiece. Justin Bethel, 3. The Perry Nickerson influx is obviously a big one. I thought he settled in okay. Uh, I thought the Panthers did some good work from a coaching perspective early in the game to get their best receiver, Adam Thielen, matched up against him. And uh, from a route running perspective and a physicality perspective, I, I thought Perry was challenged a little bit. But his his vision of routes and effective communication with the secondary when they're in bunch sets and you're trying to pass stuff off and react to throws and react to the ball in the air. Uh, I thought he settled in okay. Grand scheme of things, I don't think that's your answer at that position. I think there's two players that are going to be coming back in the next couple of weeks uh, that would probably go immediately to the front of the line. That's Nick Needham coming off the pup for the Achilles injury, assuming he is back to anywhere near the athletic profile of what we saw from him uh, last season. And then Jalen Ramsey. I think Jalen Ramsey is the massive domino to fall uh, because Jalen Ramsey allows you to permanently move Cater into the slot. If you want him there, you can move Xavier Howard around. You can be a little bit more matchup fluid if you'd like to be. And I think they would be with, with Jalen Ramsey, assuming he is back uh, to the athletic profile. That is the standard and expectation for him as an athlete. So I, I get we're trying to tread water here and get this figured out. But I think the back half of the season, it's going to look different. And it's going to look different because I think you have a math changer player in Jalen Ramsey who's lingering on the horizon. And what that does is that that changes the entire complexion of the secondary. I thought Cater was fine. Uh, I know everybody has their gripes about Eli Apple in coverage. I will say this. I do think Eli Apple, after Cater Kohu, is your best run support corner on the team right now. I respect the heck out of Eli Apple for the effort that he gives from depth to identifying key run, beat blockers on the perimeter, and get up and make plays and tackle near the line of scrimmage in space. He did it last week, and he did it again this week. From a coverage perspective, is he the most sticky? No. Does he see stuff the earliest and the quickest? No. Does he have the fastest feet? No. If he's going to try to carry routes that, that come across the middle of the field, He's going to give up some separation, so you better have some leverage support to help him out. But he's certainly a better run support player, I think, at this stage than what Xavier Howard is. And X, you know, he's day-to-day -day with the groin. Mike McDaniel said that on Monday. That's good news. X can certainly still go. Uh, I think X, you see the switch flip every once in a while, and, and he really turns it on. He nearly had the interception in the red zone on the, the touchdown pass. He actually tipped that with both hands that Adam Thielen caught after it slipped through his fingertips. And then they had a fourth down opportunity where it was a turnover on downs. And they tried to take a shot down the field to Hayden Hurst. And Zavian Howard drew him in coverage on a deep corner route. And you know what? Zavian Howard never looked more sticky in coverage in his entire life. He ran that route for Hayden Hurst. And Bryce Young just happened to hit it 10 yards uh, foul and out of bounds or, or long trying to get it to Hayden Hurst because he's jumping in the pocket to try and throw touch fields, touch throws down the field. And that's a testament to the pass rush and what it offered. So if I had to point to a winner from each group, uh, I, I do think up front, it's the trio of Chubb, Sealer, and Wilkins. You can't tell the story of what the Dolphins did defensively in this game, giving up 14 points, really buckling down as this game went along without pointing to them. And their backups in Raekwon and Deshaun Hand in this game, you felt the difference when they weren't on the field. And then Bradley Chubb should have had two sacks. I, I'm sorry, that was not a defensive penalty on the second sack that they had on Bryce Young. 
From a linebacker perspective, I would probably point to Jerome Baker uh, for the communication, uh, for him playing around and through the, the, the back issue that he had. Uh, I, I did think the, the script allowed you to mitigate the difference from him to Duke Riley from what they both bring to the table. Jerome had a couple of really nice physical hits in that game. And then uh, in the secondary, I'd probably point to Deshaun Elliott because Deshaun Elliott allowed Javon Holland to really move around throughout the course of this game. We talked a little earlier about how they would they were starting to roll the safety down uh, onto the second level in zone to kind of eye and cut those crossing routes across the middle because Carolina had success with a couple of them in the first half. Well, Javon's getting down low, and now they're not throwing him. Now, now you're getting uh, coverage where you got five guys picket fence across the intermediates, and Javon Holland is a part of that, and he's looking for crossers. So the Carolina's response later in the game is you get into these third and fourth downs, and they're trying to convert, and they're saying, well, we can't throw it short because they're going to rally and tackle us. And I can't throw it in the area that we had success earlier in the game because now you have Javon Holland who's hunting in that area of the field. So now we got to try and push the ball down the field on some of these must have it big down and distances. And Bryce Young missed every single throw in that regard because they squeezed and compressed the pockets, but also because they trusted Deshaun Elliott. Deshaun Elliott's become a really nice football player for this team. I think he's somebody who um, may be here beyond this year and be a starter uh, because he's certainly trending that kind of momentum throughout the course of the game. And Deshaun Elliott had a couple of really nice tackles from depth in the box between the tackles. So those would be the players that I would point to. If I had to point to um, players who you you'd like to see more from moving forward, I, I think it's the players who played directly behind all three of those players up front, Raquan Davis, um, Deshaun hand, uh, Emmanuel Agba, as far as the front. I don't really have any qualms with, with what Duke Riley provided you throughout the course of the game. So maybe I'd point to Channing. Can we see Channing Tindall develop and get to a point where he's ready to contribute defensively? I don't know. But it's something that I, it's at least on my wish list. And then in the secondary, um, I'd probably point to from a coverage perspective, would like to see more out of Eli Apple being more combative. Now he he had a couple plays late in the game where he's kind of sitting on stuff. And but they also had a few open targets that receivers just quite frankly didn't catch the ball. And then from a run support perspective, I would look at Xavier Howard and say, you know, if, if this defense is going to reach its final form, X as far as identification and angles to get up in support on the perimeter. And I know that's not the primary responsibility within the defense. I understand that. But just looking at this game in totality and seeing, hey, there's a little bit of meat on the bone here. There's a little bit of meat on the bone here. There's some constructive criticism. You won by 21 points, but let's piece it together so we can become a more complete unit. When you play teams like Philadelphia, that's probably what my list would look like. That's just my two cents. Now we're going to get ready for Philadelphia. The rest of the week here on Locked on Dolphins. So plan accordingly. You can find us on YouTube or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. I appreciate you guys for checking out the show. Make it a great rest of your day. Fins up, and I'll be back to talk more Dolphins with you all again soon. Peace.